remember as a community of mourners, understanding that through remembrance comes redemption, that through remembrance we can move from despair to hope, from Holocaust to homeland. I'd like you to please refer to your programs that you received as you came in as a guide to this sacred service. If you want to know who's playing, about the composer, what it has to do with this evening, it's all in there. Following the service, there'll be a reception in our social hall with a photographic exhibit of our featured Holocaust composer and survivor, Percy Haid, who following the Holocaust made his home in Chicago. If you need to leave, we understand. If you're able to stay for a while, please do so. It's in the adjoining reception room past the partition outside the doors. At this time, we're going to light the memorial candles, one for each million that were killed. And we say, how can we fathom this enormity of loss? Our hearts try to gather in the countless faces. You, O oh Holy One, summon each. Images burned in your remembrance. Help us to recall. Help us to recall their lives and their destruction. Bring us to your sacred place of memory, not only to bear witness, but to reassemble faith, to recover the defile, and to make it holy. These slender flames are a promise and a charge calling us to honor and to imitate righteousness. These flames illuminate truth's horror and hope's future, your searing reminder, do not forget. Let us bless you, Holy One, touching fire to wick, six candles to burn in testimony. Let us bless you, Holy One, for, your, for you dry our tears, you comfort martyred souls, you bring us shalom. I'd like to ask the rabbis in our midst to please come up to light the candles. And behind the candle lighting, you'll hear the music, Eli Eli, written by Hannah Sash. <laughs> Tends to get lost or forgotten. 
We must remember that prior to the Holocaust, people lived normal everyday lives. When Hitler became chancellor in Germany, first slowly and then more rapidly, life was turned upside down and everything became the opposite for which it was created. Instead of protecting people and human rights, the local and federal government apparatus, security, police forces and law became instruments for destruction, death, and eventually genocide. Doctors became agents of death. Lawyers became defenders of death. And many intellectuals and teachers used their intellect and influence on students and disciples to promote, create, and facilitate the racist and genocidal aspirations of the Nazi regime. Sonia writes about her family prior to the war. She says, we were a middle class family living in Lithuania, in the town of Shavu. Our family consisted of our wonderful father, Max, whom I loved very much. He had such a good way with, his, with us children. He was always with a smile, interested in things we did and very proud of his family. He was known as an honest and smart man, and often people used to come to him for his advice. He was also very charitable. My father's parents lived in Kedianne, Lithuania, who had a nice Jewish community. Nobody survived the war. All the Jews were killed before the Germans gave the order to do so. My grandfather Shlomo Pessin was a felcher, a folk healer, as they used to call them in those days. Before a person went to a doctor, they used to go to the felcher for all kinds of remedies. My aunt Sonia emigrated to Palestine. My grandmother was a midwife. My mother's uncle was a pious Jew with a yard goods store. Farmers from all around used to come to buy in the store. And he was also a gabba, a treasurer in his synagogue. Summer vacations consisted of visiting family, bringing presents, especially beautiful hand-sewn dresses for the girls. My mother's cousin had a flower mill. My beautiful mother Rachel had a gorgeous singing voice, soprano. She was creative and gifted. They used to sew beautiful clothes for us, and there really wasn't a thing she couldn't do. My father used to say, she has, she has golden hands. My father was a Zionist. He even bought land with the group. <coughs> Pre Holocaust, this is how the family lived in Lithuania. Little did they know what would happen to them. What nightmare of a life will follow them to their death.
That same night was a strong knock on the door. Two Lithuanians and one German came in and arrested my father and my friend Alec. That was the last time I saw my dear dad and Alec. 
Every day came out new edicts, turning in all radios, all gold and silver, including heirlooms, such as candlesticks, Hanukkah menorahs, trays, and jewelry. The edicts read, disobedience will be punished by death. More edicts. All furs have to be turned in. Jews had to get off the sidewalks and walk on the streets in the curb like ducks. Two people could not walk together. Jews had to put a yellow Star of David on their clothes. Curfews were imposed where anyone seen on the street who was Jewish would be spot, shot on the spot. All Jews were fired from their jobs, skilled and unskilled people alike. Everyone had to work for the Germans. It was so hard to get food. The Lithuanians collaborated with the Germans. One day, we were grabbed off the street and made to work from dusk till dawn in the fields pulling out carrots. The food was meager, and we were cut off from the world. People lived in great confusion. All kinds of rumors were circling around. One person asked the other for opinions, but really, nobody knew anything. Everyone lived day by day, and were so scared what the future would bring. No one expected anything good, but in their wildest imagination, could never picture what was really in store for them. We were finally moved to the Traku Ghetto, to Linkachiai, then to Stutthof, and later to the concentration camp of Dacha. From her entire family, Sonia Haid and her sister Chasia were the only ones who were to survive the Holocaust. After the war, she emigrated with her husband, Percy, and son to America, and settled right here in Chicago.
night in Dachau. We were to stand on the apple plots until roll call. A man stood not far from me and was knocking both hands against his body in order to keep warm. I did not pay much attention to him. He was a stranger to me. I didn't know him. I saw him again a few days in a row when, we, when he started talking to me before the lineup. By some good luck, he told the German that he was a musician and also knew how to print very well. He spoke perfect German. The murderer took a liking to him and gave him a job inside the camp to work in the office. He made all kinds of signs. He came from the Kovno ghetto and introduced himself to me by the name of Percy Haid. The Germans called him Blader Lagermaler, the stupid camp printer. This was also how he had to report in the morning for his work. The German whom he taught how to play the accordion would sometimes bring him a little additional food. So in comparison, he had, a much better, had it much better than the other inmates. Every morning, I used to see him and I enjoyed talking to him. He was an intelligent person and we always found things to talk about. He was very thin, tall and dark and had beautiful brown eyes that had a friendly sparkle in them when I talked to him. Strangely enough, I too started to wait for the mornings to come so I could talk to him. <clears throat> there was an aura of warmth about him. We were attracted to each other. And so a romance started to develop on the apple plots. What a place of all places. I saw the kindness in this man from the very beginning when we met. He told me he lived in Riga, Latvia, and then came to Lithuania. He was an accomplished musician and composer. He wrote about 100 popular songs and some of them are published. While in Kaunas, he worked in Cafe Monica where he played the piano and accordion. He was a classical pianist. His first teacher was his mother who held two degrees, one in music and the other in art. Percy helped anyone where the opportunity arose. He made a hiding place for his family where they put food and water in there and some first aid things. Helping others and providing for the emergencies was very dangerous. It could spell death. One day at the apple plots, Percy said to me, Chibi, my nickname, do you like music? Then you like me too. He told me that they had an orchestra in the Kovno ghetto and people who liked music used to come to the concerts to forget themselves for an hour or so from all of their troubles. Percy played the accordion and piano along with other musicians. He wrote a few songs in the ghetto like Mamale, Shamele, and people used to sing them. That evening, we heard about the liquidation of the Kovno ghetto and the big action that followed where about 10,000 people were killed at the Ninth Fort. That night, I was tormented and it was also hard to comprehend how can a real human being be so cruel to his fellow men.
saw Percy again in the morning, and he made me feel better. He gave me a little piece of paper, which I put in my pocket right away. It was dangerous to receive and keep notes, for they checked at the gate, and they had found that there would have been grave consequences, but somehow I kept it. It said, and this is a translation from the German, if you love me. I don't know you, nevertheless I love you. It has been like that. I will not change it. If you love me, I do not know. But I only know that love hurts. I was pleasantly surprised by this note and all the notes that he had subsequently sent to me, which I had saved. And so I answered him, Mr. Percy Hayde, the angels, they call it empire of heaven. The devils, they call it pain of hell. The people, they call it love. Your little attentiveness gave me a lot of joy. I have to emphasize again that my heart was full of happiness, that in a time of hard slavery, to find a moment of lifting one's soul, these few lines told me something beautiful. We were both falling in love and used to see each other every morning and also talk sometimes through the fence when the guards were away. Being in love gave us both an incentive to try very hard to survive the war. One day, he gave me a piece of paper, and when I opened it, I saw the song was written on it. I couldn't believe my eyes. He made the lines for the music on a plain piece of paper, and the notes were written on them. It said, I'm Trump. And the other side had said, Percy Hay, a dream for you. Tonight I dreamt of you. You kissed my lips. You were so good to me, but it was a dream. A dream of love and happiness of yearning hours. Oh, come back to me, so destiny should bind us together. Your eyes look at me. They ask me. My reply is and remains, I love you. Tonight I dreamt of you, I kissed your lips. You were so good to me, but it was only a dream.
States, the song Ain Trom, A Dream for You, was recorded by Eddie Fisher under the title, I Remember When. While Mr. Haig worked in the so-called office, he had a chance to get a pencil or scraps of paper. On scraps, he started to write his symphonic work, his fantasy in gal, fantasy in yellow, for the yellow star of David that we wear on our clothes in the ghetto. He finished it after the war. It was performed at the Grand Park in Chicago, conducted by Nikolai Malko. The score was handwritten and is now in the archives of Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, and also a copy of it in the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And now it is be being heard once again for the first time since the 1950s here at Temple Anshe Sholem for, for our Holocaust memorial service Thanks to the generosity of Brett Werb, musicologist at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, who sat with me, reviewed music with me, and was instrumental in making this evening possible. He was actually supposed to be present this evening. Something came up. He gave me a long letter of regret. Let me just extend his regrets without reading the letter. And it was a lot about the composition, which you'll be able to figure out by yourselves by listening to it. We are also honored by the presence of Percy Hayes' sons, Joseph and Max, who through their talents have helped to put this evening together. So we might hear the music once again, meet its composer through music in a multimedia presentation, and have a deeper appreciation for our observance tonight seeing it through the eyes of the life of one survivor, Percy Hay. Mm -hmm. I also want to take just a moment to, before you hear this fantasy and go, to thank our wonderful uh, musicians up here tonight. We're talking about hours and hours of practice. These aren't the Brahms and the normal melodies that you learn in, in the seminary or in school or in practice or you do in concerts. These are unusual pieces, and they practice hard, and they practice together and apart, 
until it all came together. Fantasy and Gout is a very long piece, and it was all handwritten. And so first they had to decipher it. And then they had to figure out, because the name of this program is Fragments. Fragments of pieces that came from the Holocaust to relate to the Holocaust that represented or mirrored the fragmented lives of the people who lived in the Holocaust kingdom. And trying to put those fragments together to make a more intelligible whole or something that we can better understand. So I thank all our musicians for helping us to feel and to understand just a little bit more. Sonia concluded her memoirs with these words. After the war, I had two little boys, Max, who was born in Munich in 1947, and Joseph, who was born in Chicago in 1951. I recall that I used to get nightmares that my children were taken from me. I used to wake up in a sweat, frightened and breathing very heavily. Though I realized I was safe in my bed, I always went into my ch children's bedroom and looked at them. They slept so peacefully in the warm, clean beds. I just stood there watching them and thought to myself how lucky they were to be living in the United States of America. While I watched my children sleep, I thought of the poor motherless in the ghetto who came home from work and didn't find their children anymore. 